Hi and welcome back to the History Hut. I'm Jim, this is Dr. Kane. We're talking about the Romans in Scotland. So, the Romans have everything under control with Hadrian's Wall? Well, kind of, kind but of? not quite. Not, really. <laughs> not quite. And, and I, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the second occupation of the North comes because, of course, as the emperors change, they all have different ideas about what they'd like uh, to be done. So the, the second occupation of the North comes under Antonius Pius in 143 AD, and it involves another wall, uh, which, of course, is named after him, called the Antonine Wall, not the, uh, the Pius Wall or the Antonius Wall. Uh, the Antonine Wall, and it's stretched, um, it's a little bit higher up um, and it's about 37 miles long and it's just rubble covered in turf so, and it's not really high and it has a big ditch in front of it so that if you tried to run at the wall you would mm -hmm. fall down <laughs> you'd fall down the ditch so into this defensive ditch you couldn't kind of leap at it and I, I don't think the Scots are known for long jumping or uh, any of those other what's that other oh, one with so. the big long pole Pole vaulting. Pole vaulting, yeah, that's the one. So no, not known for that. Um, but it, it was built because there were new problems in the north and the Roman generals felt if they could seal off the highlands and the glens, they could uh, they could end the rebellions. So the Antonine Wall just becomes another buffer zone. It has forts along it at uh, about two mile intervals. And it runs into trouble within the decade because people just keep swarming at uh, all sorts of different groups. So you have large scale revolts um, sweeping the legions back to the old wall and uh, Hadrian's Wall was in a, a kind of in a state of disrepair by that time. But really it become again becomes a kind of backup wall. That's the place that they keep going to. Uh, the Antonine Wall is finally abandoned just after the turn of the century, about, about 207 AD. And... Um, from then on there's constant trouble and this is the first time that you see mention in the Roman records of, of uh, a name for the people that are the rebels and they often talk about them as the Picts. So 279 AD I think is the first time or one of the first times that you see the Romans talking about these rebels and calling them uh, the Picts and uh, they associated the Picts with any kind of raiders at all so they may well have been associated with the Hiberni Irish. Um, they're also referred to as the Caledonians Caledonians, and um, they they just cause absolutely nothing but trouble for for the Romans. So it's more of a you know having having kept you locked up behind that big firewall, people kind of get together and going right. Let's get rid of these mm -hmm. Romans. Let's get rid of them. Uh, so when possible, they're kept under military rule. But when that failed, sometimes they just paid them off, and that's why we see these silver hordes in different parts of the country that they may well have just said right, okay, take this and stop stop attacking us. So the Roman occupation is kind of patchy and um, imperial crises call for uh, Roman troops to be, be sent home. Um, and by the 3rd and 4th century, the, uh, the Roman Empire is having all sorts of problems with outsiders, all sorts of problems of its own with lots of Germanic peoples. And, and uh, um, later on, you'll get you know, the Huns, so Asian peoples that eventually bring down the uh, and the empires, you get the Huns, the Visigoths, the Lombards, the Angles, the Saxons, the Avars, the Alans, there's <laughs> just like an unlimited amount of them. But in, uh, for the Romans anyway, the big, the big, the biggest uh, and most difficult time is after the three, but you know, 376 when you have the Visigoths crossing the Danube and then 406 they cross the Rhine uh, and then they cross into Gaul and they cut off the Roman Empire from Britain and Roman troops are asked to fall back to the empire to kind of protect the heartland and so there's actually a mutiny amongst uh, Roman soldiers in Britain in uh, 409 and um, a failed attack on the island by the Saxons. So by about 410, Rome sacked by the barbarians or the folk wanderers, or whatever you want to call them. And that really uh, marks the end of Roman rule on the island as well because they have to, uh, they have to leave too. So uh, you get local raids increasing, although they have no idea what's going on in Europe. Uh, they have local raids increasing in intensity. There's no troops to hold them off and so the, the Roman occupation is is really over. So, so you do have Hadrian's Wall, then you have the Antonine Wall, but then it's all these external issues that, that really bring problems to the Romans and then it's just no longer you know, necessary to kind of hold on to that to that area. And by that time there's also Angles and Saxons have moved into the southern part of the island. 
So what's the legacy of the Roman occupation or visit or wall building? Uh, you, you know, um, it, it is interesting because I mean, obviously, um, as she as she said, there's there's the wall, so there's there's um, archaeological stuff, right? There's there's like physical stuff that they leave behind. Um, there's in in digs in Scotland so far, and this may change. There's a, a, a kind of lack of Roman artifacts in the north and in the west. So in the Highlands, there isn't much evidence of any kind of physical impact at all, um, and that fits in quite well with with what we know about the the lack of influence that the Romans actually have in the Highlands. But there's lots of physical evidence of the Romans. There's viaducts and aqueducts and um, a few Roman technological innovations. Like the you know the the scythe and the anvil and iron nails and stuff like that. Um, no civilian settlements really have been uncovered except for these kind of refugee camps south of the wall. Uh, but there is uh, a marvellous display of uh, Roman artefacts at the National Gallery in Scotland uh, of Scotland in Edinburgh, um, and a great display of things like Roman coins at the Hunterian in Glasgow. So there's lots of things like that. Uh, but the legacy, um, as I said before, you know, the Scots kind of pride themselves on not having had much of a legacy from the Romans. Like, you can't teach us a thing. We're not interested uh, unless it's got to do with deep fried food. Um, so um, it, one of the key things, I think, is that it's during the occupation of the Romans that uh, the first signs of Christianity are seen in the northern part of the island. Not in the north, but in the northern part of the island. And it's uh, primarily through the work of St. Ninian, who... Uh, who was sent to minister to a small Christian community in the southwestern part of Scotland. Um, this was celebrated uh, in September of 2010 by Pope Benedict's visit to Scotland. They celebrated the, the impact um, of Roman Christianity there. So um, most, most people argue that the great contribution of the Romans in Scotland is that it unified the northern peoples. That's certainly one thing. Uh, it isolates them from everybody else and by the time the Romans leave the island uh, there are at least two distinct warrior groups ready to defend themselves against outsiders and they're, they're, uh, they have intimate knowledge of course of, the, of their territory so they're more than capable of uh, defending themselves. Um, so the Roman legacy is it leaves a, a, a bit of a physical mark and um, not much of a not really much of an intellectual mark but this has all been kind of currently revised so that that may well those kind of ideas may well uh, change. So um, you know, the legacy of the church, absolutely uh, a physical legacy, but nothing like the legacy that's left uh, in the southern part of the island with, with urban settings and things like that. Yeah. So who was left on the island once the, the Romans left? And ah. did any of those people influence the people north of the wall? Uh, yeah, I mean, there there are people in the island the whole time, right? We talked about this before, the, the Stone Age people, we talked about the people of uh, the people of the north, and now we'll talk a little bit about the four peoples that are there in that period when the Romans are there, before it, and to uh, a, a great extent after it as well. So the four peoples of Scotland are uh, the Picts, um, the Scots, the Britons, and the Angles, and you could actually add in, after the Roman period, you could add in the Norsemen as well, so you could add in the Vikings too, because they have quite a significant uh, impact on the country, maybe even much more of an impact than the, the Romans had. So I just want to talk about the Picts, because that's the that's probably the um, the group that gets the most attention these days, the, the group that we also know or knew the, the least about, and the group that people often thought, well, where did they go? You know, there's, there's like Picts, 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 Picks, 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 and then all of a sudden around 900 AD, it's just the Kingdom of Scotland, the Kingdom of Alba, where do the Picts go? What actually happens to them? So so the, the, uh, the four groups are do have a lot of contact with each other at, at various different times, but probably uh, the most dominant group are uh, the Picts. So it's the kind of key group. Um, the word Pict is a, is a historic term. It's it was introduced by classical writers to kind of loosely describe the people that the Romans ran up against in the north. Remember I said from the third century on. Uh, until their disappearance from the historic record in about uh, the, the 900s. So the, the term Pict or Picti was uh, a slang term used by Roman soldiers for anybody that was kind of living north of the wall. Sometimes they referred to the area as Caledonia. 
uh, other times uh, just north of the wall and it may well have been because they tattooed their bodies and they, uh, they dyed their skin blue for battles. They use things like woad. So um, Mel here hasn't got any on but if you've ever watched Braveheart you see those guys with the, the blue on. I tried it once <laughs> um, but it just closes up all your pores and makes you feel really ill. So don't try it at home. But the word picked is from the same root as the, the Latin word for picture. So it's like, you know, painted pictured people. Mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, another word that's used is pretani and uh, it's PR I-T-E-N-I, -E Pretani, and that means the people of shapes and designs. So again, this idea of painting yourself before going into the battle. And it's also a variant of the word um, Britain. So it could have been used to identify people in North Britain, which would have been in, in our territory. And uh, the Romans had given the southerners on the island a new name. They called them Britanni. And so Pritani, there's not there's not much of a difference, not much yeah. of a leap to make that um, uh, to make that. So Britanni, uh, possibly a, a Latin corruption of uh, Pritani. Uh, so there are all sorts of reasons for them being called the Picts, but we believe them now to have been the ancient inhabitants of the island. And uh, this is why we talked so much the other day about um, Scotland in the Stone Age, because until quite recently, and that of course is kind of historian speak for a couple of decades ago, um, it was generally accepted that the Scotty, uh, this group who'd come from Ireland about the 6th century, um, were the ones that that developed the Kingdom of Scotland and uh, that they may have come across an older people in the land but that, that older people had only been there a few more hundred years than they had so the same old kind of oh yeah you've only been here a little while you're immigrants just like us we're going to take you over uh, and it looks you know so they thought that, the, that these people that they ran into when they crossed over had only been there a few hundred years and so they had every right to you know fight them for the land and we we know more or less know that this is wrong and that the people they ran into these people that were called the picks were the stone age the descendants of those stone age peoples had actually been there for a really 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 long time and the the really cool thing the the cool new development is that uh, in fact the people that thought of themselves as the scotty or the scots who believed that they come from ireland may not have come from ireland at all they may well have also been Picts. They may also have been people who had lived there for this, you know, thousands and thousands of years. But because of the geography, remember we talked about how difficult it was to move inside the country. Because of the geography, they may well have had so many trade contacts with the Irish just across the Irish Sea that they came to believe that, you know, their languages came to be similar and mm -hmm. some of their cultural traditions came to be similar so they thought they were from there and of course they're helped along by the Irish writers, the Irish analysts who talk about the Scotty coming to Scotland and then becoming the, the dominant group. So it's really cool. Uh, again, archaeology just kind of slapping everybody around and going, <laughs> this this may not in fact be true anymore. Uh, so um, so this Pretani or Pict, um, these are the people that, that the Romans talked about. Uh, they, uh, now it looks as though they were the original people of Scotland. Uh, they controlled the area from uh, the, the, the Forth up to the Pentland Firth and then up to uh, Orkney. And they were again split by geography into two groups. So the ones living uh, north of the line or north of the Mount were called the Caledoni. And the ones that were south of it were called the Maytae. It's M-A-E-T-A-E. M-E. M-A-E-A-T-A-E. -A -E. Uh, the Maytae and the Caledoni. Uh, and as I said a minute ago, it's not until the Irish analysts begin to write the history of the Scots from Ireland, who they call the Dalriada, um, that the Picts are suddenly portrayed as uh, a people who are just themselves recent immigrants. And of course, um, I think I have the Venerable Bede's name up on my on my blackboard. And um, the Venerable Bede creates a, a whole kind of backstory for the Picts, where they came from, and says, you know, that they, they came from Scythia, which is probably like around the Ukraine and that they you know jumped in a boat and then they all mm -hmm. sailed to Spain they get kicked out of Spain they sailed to Ireland they get kicked out of Ireland the Irish go like there's a wee place over there right you just go over there 
on you go on your way and uh, and then they end up in uh, in Scotland so the so there is actually kind of uh, and the the venerable Bede I mean obviously um, great writer and historian and wrote the Historia Ecclesiastica the the history of the English Church and the history of England and there's a part on page 39 of the venerable Bede's yeah. book on uh, on the Picts and this whole idea of the Scotty and and the Picts just coming in from a, from another place and then of course everybody just picks that up as as the truth and it's not until the modern period that we see there might actually be some problem with that. Uh, and of course, um, according to the Venerable Bede and the Irish analysts, when the Picts uh, come en route from Scythia, they, like crazy people, they bring a big stone with them, but they forget to bring women, which isn't mm. good. So when they get to Ireland, they're like, oh, you know, can we stay here? And the Irish are like, no, no, you can't stay here. But um, if you go over to if you go over to that place over there, we'll give you some women uh, to take with you as long as your royal line then is descent descends through the matrilineal side so that uh, there's, you know, this kind of Irish importance to it. So um, kings would be, uh, this is the beginning of the tanistry system as well, kings would be succeeded um, by their, their brothers, their their mother's sons or their nephews, their sister's sons. So there's a kind of, you know, um, but the, the matrilineal part is really important. So, um, yeah, it's meant to show all of that, all his writings are meant to show that the Picts aren't native to Caledonia, so they don't really have any prior rights to it at all. So that's very interesting. And that remains the, the basic plot line for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, scholars now believe that the Picts were the original inhabitants of northern Scotland and uh, as we talked about before that their, their early settlements date at least to about 5,000 years ago. Uh, and um, the, the, that possibly the people that come later are, are in fact the Dalriada Scots and immigrate from Ireland but maybe not because more changes on, on that front as well. So uh, finding out, that, you know, the Picts as, the, as the, uh, the founding peoples then, finding out about the Picts is really problematic. There's lots of attempts have been made, uh, but it's problematic because they don't leave a written script. So it's not like they've left behind a written record saying this is who we are. We are the people. This mm -hmm. is who we are. Uh, they have left symbols. So we have symbol stones and the symbol stones are, are very enigmatic. Uh, their language doesn't seem to be Indo-European, which is, uh, is puzzling too. Uh, their female succession, m this may or may not have been correct. It may have been something that comes to us because of the Irish writers. Uh, they don't leave any documents and of course they've disappeared as a people but we do actually know a bit about them uh, and they've become a, a huge focus of early Scots history. It's kind of one of those really cool things to, to look at. So we do know a little bit about them um, and uh, maybe next time I'll tell you about them. Oh, yeah, maybe. If you're lucky. <laughs> if you're lucky, you'll find out about the pigs. Well, the doctor says that wraps up part two of our discussion. So join us again for part three where you may or may not find out more about that. <laughs>